Welcome back to our lecture one, part two of the Pain Throughout Organ Systems uh, lecture series. Let's get right into it. So why do we have pain anyway? Believe it or not, it's to protect us. For example, say that you're standing in the kitchen and rest your hand on the stove top. You know the kind where um, it's just a flat, smooth surface. Unless you were in the room 10 minutes before, you might not know that your brother just made hard-boiled eggs on the burner and that you just put your hand on it. It hasn't quite cooled off yet, so it'll definitely burn your hand. The only thing keeping it from causing permanent damage is pain. The sensory neurons run along the afferent pathway and carry that pain signal back to your spinal cord where it can decide what to do with the stimulus. The CNS is the interpretive center, and it'll realize that the pain signal sent to it signifies danger to the hand, so it'll send out a motor response down the efferent pathway. The muscles in your hand will receive that motor signal, and you pull your hand away from the hot surface. Pretty straightforward. Hopefully, this was a review from you for you. If not, you might want to get an anatomy and physiology text out and uh, quickly review this topic. Remember, sensory is afferent, motor is efferent. They are the same, S-A, sensory afferent, motor efferent, M-E, same. This drawing should look very familiar to you by this point in your studies. As the sensory neuron is stimulated from touching the hot handle, it sends an afferent signal to the inner neuron in the spinal cord where the inner neuron makes the decision to send an efferent signal to the flexor muscles in the arm to cause a motor response to withdraw the hand. Same thing we just talked about. This whole process started with the stimulation of free nerve endings in the hand called nociceptors. Nociceptors are small, unmyelinated, and lightly myelinated nerve endings that can be found in almost all the tissues throughout the body. Here are some examples. Sensory nociceptors use sensory nerves, duh, to transmit the stimuli from pain receptors in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, as you just saw. As you can see from the drawing here, there are different kinds of pain. Physical pain is only one of them, but clearly there are other stimuli that can cause feelings that we associate with the sensation of pain. From this list of physical pain nociceptors, we see that some respond to chemical stimuli, some to mechanical some to thermal or heat as we just talked about. Again, they are for our protection. Just the other day, in fact, I spilled bleach on my back um, and chest and didn't get it off for a few hours when it started to really burn. This chemical burn caused by a strong base in this case persisted for a long time until I could get it neutralized by lots of water and vinegar mixture. Without that physical pain present from my chemical nociceptors, the bleach could have eaten further into my body while I slept which is never ideal. Okay, chemical, mechanical, thermal. <coughs> the last thing that I really want to say about nociceptors at this point is that they're found pretty much everywhere, with a few notable exceptions. Can you list somewhere that nociceptors are not found? I mean, look at this list. Okay, let's talk about the specific theory of pain for a second. This says that the intensity of pain is directly related to, another, to the amount of associated tissue injury. Well, duh. We also probably already know that acute pain or pain that comes on suddenly seems to hurt more and we can usually tell someone exactly where it hurts. On the other hand, chronic pain or pain that's always there over a long time or even pain that's primarily coming from our own head, called cognitive pain, is much more difficult to localize in the exact spot. We see that all the time with chronic back pain, don't we? It hurts somewhere in the lower back, but sometimes it's difficult to determine exactly where. So what is a neuromodulator? They're simply substances or chemicals that make pain either more or less, quote, painful. For example, if a neuromodulator makes our sensation of pain feel worse, then it's called excitatory, or it excites the nerves that carry pain sensation. An example of this is, coincidentally enough, is called substance P, 
On the other side, if a neuromodulator lessens our pain, it's said to be inhibitory. You've probably already heard of some of these. Uh, GABA, G-A-B-A, is a popular example, and we'll look at that in more detail on the next slide under the broad category of endorphins. But also, norepinephrine is a well-known inhibitory neuromodulator of pain, although you might not have thought about it in that way before. Hopefully, this little drawing also looks very familiar to you already. It's our basic synapse that we've seen many times in anatomy and physiology, or even in general physiology. Here, at this junction, we have neurotransmitters released into the neural cleft where they find receptors specifically made for that particular neurotransmitter, waiting to receive them on the other side of the cleft. In this particular illustration, GABA, the green endorphin, hang on, right there, or our inhibitory neuromodulator, GABA, is attaching the opiate receptors, or attaching to the opiate receptors and not letting the pain stimulus propagate any further towards the brain cell. So it's cutting it off. Of course, usually GABA is not interfering with all of the receptors and blocking the release of all excitatory neurotransmitters. So it's decreasing the pain, but not eliminating it completely. This is called competitive inhibition when GABA jumps into a receptor um, that was meant for an excitatory neurotransmitter. And it's also a major mechanism by which many drugs like opiate drugs work. I'm going to break off right here and we'll pick this up on the next video.